We're super excited to partner with Laura Reagan, LCSWC, who created the Trauma Therapist Network, an amazing community providing support and training for relational trauma and attachment therapists. Check out our special affiliate link, bit.ly forward slash MTSG dash TTN for more information. That's bit.ly forward slash MTSG dash TTN, all caps, for more information. You're already listening to our podcast, so let's get you some continuing education. We provide monthly CE pod courses. We already have 12 and are adding new ones every month. Check them out at moderntherapistcommunity.com forward slash pod course. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Hey, Modern Therapists, we're so excited to offer the opportunity for one unit of continuing education for this podcast episode. Once you've listened to this episode, to get CE credit, you just need to go to moderntherapistcommunity.com, register for your free profile, purchase this course, pass the post-test, and complete the evaluation. Once that's all completed, you'll get a CE certificate in your profile, or you can download it for your records. For a current list of our CE approvals, check out moderntherapistcommunity.com. Once again, hop over to moderntherapistcommunity.com for one CE once you've listened. Woohoo! Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Winhelm with Katie Bernoy, and this is the podcast for therapists about the things that we do in our practices, the ways that we interact with the world, the continuing education that we earn by listening to Katie and Kurt. And... <laughs> Today, talking about defensive therapy practices, and this is all of the things that we hide behind our, or that we use to hide our anxieties, or we just flatly put our anxieties out there, and we do these things that might not always be in the best interests of the clients. And so this is as I'm mentioning, one of those continuing education episodes. You can check out our show notes or listen to the introduction or the outroduction of the episode for <laughs> your instructions on how you can earn CEs through us. But when we talk about defensive therapy practices, Katie, what comes to mind just as far as that being a term up front? It makes me very curious about what offensive therapy practices Oh, are. offensive therapy <laughs> practices, I think, is very much just like all of the things that you're like reading on social media. Like, I can't believe a therapist actually said that. So it is pretty offensive. Offen but as far as <laughs> but as far as defensive therapy practices, to me, it seems like it's folks that are so worried about whatever risk that's there that they they get super i don't know protective of themselves and they won't do anything or they do crazy things and it's like get really rigid we have a whole conversation about the development of therapists and rigidity but like it just seems like the risk level becomes so intense that therapists are only worried about themselves and the risk that they hold versus what's in the best interest of the client Yes. So defensive therapy practices, as you're describing, are pretty much exactly that. It's actions taken by a therapist that have minimal to no beneficial aspects for a client done with the intention of reducing the legal liability on the therapist. So the legal liability. So there's yes. not other types of liability that we're reducing here, or does that is that too much of a, a nuance there? What are you asking about as far as other types of liability? Because I'm in 90% law and ethics brain right now, and I can only think of liability <laughs> meaning to law and ethics. I think like business liability. Like, like if I take on this client at a reduced rate and they they need a lot of care, I am making my business less less viable because I'm making less money. Uh, so financial risk financial to liability. the therapist. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think you're probably going to end up with some questions throughout this episode on like, is this a defensive liability thing? And I will reserve that as far as the point of this episode goes, we're going to put the financial questions 
that's not part of what we're talking about when it comes to legal okay. defensive liability here. And I think that that's a really important distinction because there are decisions that therapists make that affect clients, but it's more for the finance things. Think of this more of an episode as like if capitalism didn't exist. And <laughs> here's the steps that we're doing just to minimize our steps as legally liable for clients. Wow. I'm imagining capitalism not existing. Let me just sit with that for a minute. Ah, oh, that's so nice. Okay, continue. So there tends to be two kinds of defensive practices that therapists can typically fall into. One of them is avoidant practices, things that we don't stick our necks out for in order to you know, avoid, you know, being liable for things. And, you know, just as a quick thing, we'll get into a few more examples here in a few minutes. But as a quick example of this, it's like, I can't make any opinions about anything to my clients, because if they go and they have a bad experience with that, then they're going to trace that back to me and they're going to blame me for that. Like, I can't say, I like the restaurant across the street from my office, you should try it out because the client might go there and get food poisoning and then they're going to sue me because I told them to go there. Or it could be pressuring a client to try a restaurant of your friends and now you've got a dual relationship and you're using your power over your client to make them do okay. things. Okay, and, oh so that, that's that's not an avoidant practice. Avoidant <laughs> is I'm not doing these things because I'm imagining this super giant risk. Well, of that's what I'm saying. I, avoiding things because, oh my God, it could be a dual relationship. Oh my gosh, it's it's something where if I if I give any advice... I am legally liable because they are going, if they take it, it's because I've done something wrong. Right. Okay. The other types of defensive practices are what's called assurance practices or things that we do that are maybe too big and too fast of steps in order to just absolve ourselves of any liability that could end up happening. And this is things like, Hospitalization, right? Ho like, hospitalization is yeah. the, the the very big example of that. So we're going to kind of take some of the first part of the episode here and break down what some of these practices are and how they end up being things that fall within these defensive practices. And we're going to talk through some examples throughout the episode here. And at the end, we have some recommendations to be like, don't be anxious, modern therapists. <laughs> But a lot of this does start with just kind of fear of being sued. And a lot of, you know, from the very beginning of therapist andragogy, I love what this is, word. What is therapist andragogy? Andragogy is the ways that we teach adults. You know, pedagogy means peds, kids. Ah. That, that is teaching children. Andragogy is... Adults. Teaching adults. Oh, okay. Yes. But think of every grad school's first semester classes includes phenomenal law and ethics classes. And that me, are so scary. So scary. Oh okay, my gosh. So, so let's <laughs> let's start with that. Why is it so scary? What how are most of these classes taught? Basically, whatever you do, your client is going to either sue you or die. Yeah. <laughs> And or you're going to get in trouble and lose your license, or you will never be able to get your license because you somehow did something wrong. And it's almost like it's worse than taxes. Because like with taxes, the the all the memes I was seeing, like it's like you're gonna do something wrong and you're gonna get penalized for it. We're not gonna tell you how much you have to pay, you're just gonna get something wrong. And that's kind of how law and ethics is felt is like if you do anything wrong and it, and you don't know what it is. Like there's ways to describe it, but it's kind of written in this weird code. And there's also all of the myths that everyone's telling you, like everything is a dual relationship. All dual relationships are bad. Like all the stuff that is like, if you don't follow all of these rules and the rules that keep expanding out and the rules that you don't know, you are going to hell. <laughs> like it just gets so scary. And in addition to that, you're going to have laws named after you and you're going to be taught in every other law and ethics class based on how dumb of a decision you made. It is taught in this very fearful sort of way that you have to do all of these things in order to not be in trouble. 
And you're going to be made this example of that sets this, you have to be perfect at all points in your career. And it leaves us from the very beginning of our career feeling in this situation of the best way to not make mistakes is don't take many actions. And yeah, this leads or take to, actions that are going to protect you, like mm -hmm. get really defensive, protect yes. yourself at all costs. And so this leads a lot into just kind of this lawyer phobia sort of thing. Like if I can just avoid all of the lawyers, I can avoid all of the subpoenas. I can just stay within this really safe bubble of things that I can treat really well, then I don't have to put myself at risk for anything. And this ends up being things that over time have, you know, through the therapist game of telephone that mm -hmm. ends up just being like this contagious fear that we all get left with. I mean, I admit that in preparation for this episode, I'm actually going to be changing some of the style in which I teach because oh, interesting. I've made jokes at some of the law and ethics presentations that I'm at, you know, from the beginning. Hey, this is six hours of law and ethics. If you don't walk out of here at least a little bit anxious, then I'm not doing my job. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm really taking a, a lot different perspective on this from my end of things, because I think that there's some different answers in this, but it really takes a look at our field of not being avoidant of taking steps. It's being able to look at the steps that we're taking in a more deliberate way in order to avoid liability, not just passing the liability onto somebody else. Now, the first example that we're talking about here is talking about avoidant practices that we end up taking. And you know, just kind of brainstorming before recording the episode here, we had come up with a few, but some of them you've even talked about here a little bit. But the first one that had come up on our list is therapists and talking about medical things. Yes, medical advice. So we're not doctors. No, we, we don't play doctors on TV. We don't, unless you are one of those actors turned therapists who had a previous career of playing a doctor on TV. There's a reason that we go into psychopharmacology classes. There's a reason that that is mandated in most jurisdictions to yeah. understand the mechanisms of why certain medications work with certain things. Should you tell clients that they should go and get a certain kind of medication? Absolutely not. No. Should you recognize, hey, this is something weird that's often associated with this medication that you're on. You should go and talk to your doctor about it. That is talking about medical stuff. And that is yeah. very much within the wheelhouse of the competence that you are expected to have as being a profession in this field. But like you said, there's just kind of this avoidance of like that is outside of the scope of what I do. But there's been a number of times across my career where I've identified with clients like, hey, I know you're talking about hallucinations. You're talking about voices that you're hearing. I went back and I looked up some of the side effects on some of your medications, and this seems to be tied to your asthma inhaler. We should talk with your doctors about if this is something that can fix this onset of these kinds of things that weren't here six months ago. Sure. And I think there's there's that, which is kind of like, a, are there mental health impacts of whatever's going on, or there's side effects from psychotropic medication, that kind of stuff. But I even go as far as being able to help my clients prepare for doctor's appointments. How do you mm -hmm. identify what questions to ask? How do you make sure that you're bringing up any potential side effects or things that you're you're seeing, helping them to identify what are the things that you need to make sure you tell your doctor? Obviously, then trusting the doctor will also ask questions that will expand that out and not saying this is the sum total of everything you should talk to your doctor about. But I've had folks that have a lot of anxiety around it or a lot of chronic issues that are, you know, that we have to tease out what's mental health and what's medical. And so for me, I, I go pretty deep into it, but I, I always caveat with I'm not a doctor and I don't give medical advice. But I think there's people that are so afraid of it that they don't even walk into that arena at all. And it's hard to separate out. I mean, like 
the more okay. that we can be whole people, I think the the better that we that we end up helping our clients. Well, what you're or that describing we look at them as whole people. Sorry. Well, what you're describing though is you're not giving medical advice. You're giving advice on how to talk to their medical professionals. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like deep into it. And the thing is that I have so many medical conditions that I know a lot from lived experience. And so I know that I'm tapping into, well, you might want to ask your doctor about this <laughs> <laughs> because I know it. Right. And and I, I read Medscape and I enjoy medical stuff and, and learning about it. And so it's something like, oh, I read this thing the other day. Maybe you should bring that up to your doctor. The call to action piece on something like this, that you're describing the limits of your competence, you're working within the scope of your license, takes this from, I need to avoid this at all costs, to here's the limit of my knowledge, here's the people who can actually help and extend what you're talking about here in order to be able to help the client. And I think that that's the line to more bravely step into when it comes mm -hmm. to, I'm working within the scope of my license and I have this knowledge and here's how to talk with the professionals in that space for you to be able to do this. But you've also, in some of the conversations we've had, talked about some of the defensive practices that medical practitioners have had with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I went to a specialist and this was like a general spec specialist. It was like an OBGYN or something. So somebody that would theoretically be an only doctor that a female uh, or, or AFAB person would have gone to. And I was like, hey, I've got this completely unrelated thing. Can you look at it and tell me if I need to go to the doctor? And the doctor's like, nope, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not taking a single look. I'm not going to do anything. I'm like, can you just tell me if there's something I need to do here or can I just like write it out? <laughs> They're like, nope, you have to go to the right doctor. And so, yes, this was a specialist. It felt like a pretty broad specialist because, you know, like assuming that most uh, folks who are going to be seeing a, a client or a patient every year are going to have a lot of extra knowledge like therapists do, right? Like we're supposed to know everything. We're supposed to do everything. But yeah, didn't, would not look. Hey, modern therapists. If you work with developmental trauma and attachment wounds, we bet you're feeling super isolated and super worn down right now. With the pandemic and the chaos in the world, it can be hard to find people who get it. That's why we're so excited to partner with our friend and fellow podcaster, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. She created the Trauma Therapist Network to provide support, community, and training designed just for relational trauma and attachment therapists. Meet weekly on Zoom for live calls for self-care, case consult, Q&A, and training. Use our special affiliate link, bit.ly forward slash mtsg-ttn, all caps, to join now. Registration is open until June 30th, and if you use the code TTNSAVE20, once again, all caps, you'll receive 20% off your first month. Now, you strike me as somebody who's potentially smart and knows how to talk with professionals. Potentially smart? Like, I'm, really? I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> you have seemingly the confidence to be able to speak up to your caregivers and providers and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I would say maybe more so than your average run-of-the-mill consumer when it comes yes. to... I've had to go to a lot of doctors since I was like 16. So yeah, I know how <laughs> so to talk to doctors. I, I realize we're talking about medical practitioners in this example here, but there are a there is a large part of the population that would say, hey, doc, I have a concern about this. And the doctor saying, I can't comment on that. And the consumer in that situation would just be like, oh, it must not be a cause of concern. And mm. this is one of the things where defensive practices in medicine, what we're talking about here, but also within mental health, end up being something that can provide suboptimal care to yeah. clients. And this is where our ethics codes do encourage us to talk about the limitations of our knowledge in some of these situations in order to be able to help clients make informed decisions. Yeah. You can say, hey, 
I don't know a lot about this particular thing that you're bringing up. Here's the limits of my knowledge on it. You should talk to somebody who's more specialized in this for help on this. And as an example of this, and I have a client that I've worked on and off with for years and has given me permission to educate anybody and everybody about our process because it's so far been successful. But I had a teenage client that I worked with for a few years surrounding some just general teenage stuff that was a referral to me. And they went off to college for a couple of years and they came back for some other issues. And during that process, they identified to me, hey, I think I might be trans. And I said, hey, great. I'm supportive of you. I have... 4% knowledge on how to be a (laughs) great therapist for a trans person at this point in time. And we talked through a lot of what that meant as far as our working relationship at the time. And the client made their decision to continue treatment with me based on a lot of the limitations that we discussed. The takeaway in this is we talked about the limitations of our knowledge, our competence in this area. We set out a plan for this. And most importantly, the client was able to opt in to the parts of the treatment that they wanted. And this is really that that basis of our our good ethics codes of helping patients have autonomy in making their choices. There's plenty of great therapists working with the trans community around me in the Los Angeles area here, but the client felt that the relationship was something that was more beneficial to them at the time. And you know, over the the years, there's been some things that the client has been at the forefront of knowledge and teaching me for my benefit that I've been able to pass on to some of my other trans clients. And some of the things that I've done as far as my education and becoming a better therapist have then led to some other great things for this client. So takeaway here is I do see therapists sometimes presented in those situations with, you're presenting something clinically to me that I don't have any experience with, and therefore I can no longer provide any treatment to you. And this ends up becoming one of those big avoidant practices that we really just provide suboptimal care by just shoving people away rather than really exploring a lot of what their options are. Well, I think there's another piece that came to mind when you were talking about that, and it's more of an assurant defensive practice, which is I'm going to require you to get a medical clearance or I'm going to require you to get X, Y, and Z and and potentially actively referring out or, or doing some of these things in order to protect my liability, even though what you're describing, I don't know that it's of concern. And, and it, an example. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example here. Someone who comes in and is talking about, I'm having a lot of panic attacks, but I don't know if they're panic attacks. And uh, there's this going on medically, and I've got high cholesterol, and I have this and that. And the therapist saying, you need to get medically cleared before I will see you again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like it's that thing of like, wait a second. I'll say, hey, go to the doctor. This is important that you see the doctor, but I'm not going to stop treating them and I'm not going to force them to do something that is outside of the scope of my practice anyway. I don't know. Maybe this is a, a, a muddied one, a muddy example, but like I, I've seen people putting some sort of hurdle in front of a client for them to get treatment because they're, people are so worried about something that's outside of the scope of their practice. A lot of this is just boiling down to, I want to make sure that somebody else is assuming the liability. And as long as I'm not the target of that liability, then I can be safe by taking no action. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a a fine line here. I mean, this is kind of, you know, I don't want to spend a ton of time in this episode talking about this, but this ultimately comes down to kind of some different ethical lines of thought. There's the the deontological, like if everybody does this kind of thing and it causes harm, then nobody should do this kind of thing versus the utilitarian. Yeah. Well, we're going to base this based on what the outcomes are. And if I take action and it's good, then therefore the action was good. 
and it, I don't think it's as black and white as those two differing viewpoints that there really is more of, okay, what is the thought process of what the potential benefits and harms are in taking a course of action? Yeah. I, I saw this during the pandemic when everybody was working virtually and some of the families reaching out to me saying, hey, my kid is very at risk of harm, suicidality, psychosis, sorts of things. And nobody is willing to work with us because they're afraid that things aren't going to be under control. And so this becomes, rather than a, a joint discussion with families as far as, here's the capabilities we have and here's what a treatment team looks like in this particular situation. It might not be a hundred percent as far as what we've known pre-pandemic, but here's opting into this as far as an informed decision for everybody involved. That it's kind of jumping to that flat out, I'm not going to provide any treatment that could potentially keep your kid out of the hospital versus we can maybe slow down the downward spiral that people are on. It might not be with great outcomes, but it's at least something that's still benefiting the patient. And that decision being entirely based on, am I going to get sued if this doesn't go correctly, being the part of this, making it a bad defensive practice. It's interesting because I, as I, I hear this, I think about a case and I'll change some details to make it appropriate, but like that I, I ended up referring out after seeing the client for maybe a month or six weeks because it was something where I didn't have the bandwidth in my practice. This was uh, a client who, when he called, it was clear there was a, a few things that, that there was a little bit of risk there, maybe some suicidality. It was more kind of vague suicidality, but didn't really get the full picture until he came into my office. And then as we were talking, it became clear that he was having hallucinations, which I've worked with with different kind of psychosis. I've, I've had other types of things, but this was something where I hadn't done it in private practice and my practice was full. I had many other things that I was doing. And as I was assessing this client, I realized he probably needed both twice a week sessions as well as coaching calls. There was a psychiatrist already on board, but you know, he hadn't warned me, the psychiatrist hadn't warned me that, that this was the case, that there was this, these hallucinations that were pretty impactful on this client. And I realized pretty early on, I can hold this client for the, the amount of time it takes me to find somebody to refer this client to, because I couldn't, I, I think there was an element of liability there, but it was also, I don't think that I can do the best work and, and be the right therapist for this client, given what else is on my plate. I sure. think if I had nothing else, I probably would have been great for him. But mm -hmm. because of everything else, I felt like the, I don't know, I don't know if it was liability. I don't know what, what, you know, I don't know how to describe that decision making. But for me, not seeing me was what I considered more important than, I don't know exactly where the liability, defensive practice, stuff like that came in there. But I, and maybe we can tease that out. But I, I think for me, I did not see a realistic way forward with this client, given my capacity. Right. I know that you don't like this, but I don't like this. What, what do you, you I don't like? like? You don't like what I'm about to say. Okay. But coming from being on ethics committees, looking at therapist decision making processes, what clarifies this and what shifts this from avoidant, bad decision-making to a mistake was made, but I had the right decision-making process is going through kind of those ethical decision-making things. And it's really being able to lay out, okay, you know what? Part of this is shaped by things going on in my life. You know, the personal things that are happening that, you know, might be some of our emotional capacity being overbooked and not having enough a, a time to meet with a client multiple times a week, not having enough of a treatment team decision and how that is communicated to the client as part of this process. That's actually good steps 
that aren't defensive practices. That's just good decision making. And that's the stuff that actually reduces our liability. When you're talking about like, okay, some of the stuff is muddied. Some of the stuff could have been tied to this. Some of the stuff could have been tied to this. When we look at that kind of stuff from an ethics committee standpoint, the more clear that you lay out what your thought process is in making these decisions, it's a little bit of that slower thinking kind of thing. That's what shifts it from being a defensive avoidant practice to here's a prescriptive assurance practice of, yeah, clearly this is being done for the benefit of the client, not in kind of this murky, like, well, oh, at the end of the day, this is just to avoid having any liability with this client. When I was looking at it, the first thing was, this is an insurance client. And so, you know, I didn't have the capacity in my business to to have that much time taken up by an insurance client. And maybe that's wrong, but it was just my financial reality at the time. There wasn't the other element of, I didn't have the time for all of those things, but I also didn't have the emotional capacity for all of those things. There was a lot going on in my life. I, you know, I'm picturing, you know, some of the coaching calls I did during the time that I saw this client were when I was out and about, like it was, I was doing other things. And so I had to pull over to the side or, you know, get enough privacy and have these coaching calls. And so it was disrupting my daily life, which I didn't have the resources or the resilience to, to manage. Uh, it was something where I think this client was constantly on the edge of whether or not they should be hospitalized. And, you know, we did safety plans. I think we did the right things. And the client did not go to the hospital the whole time that I had him, of course, you know, of course, the next therapist hospitalized him almost immediately. So there's a whole other mm -hmm. conversation about their defensive practices and, and whether or not I was better or worse for this client. But but it was something where knowing how much of a, of a mental toll that was going to take and how fearful I always felt for this client. Like, am, am I doing enough to keep this client from either having to go to the hospital or from dying by suicide? And so there, I, I think it was that there was the emotional element to it. And I knew that I, even though I knew what to do, you know, safety planning, coaching calls being available, you know, kind of creating a team within their family and trying to add to the to the service providers, I didn't think I could consistently stay up to that standard. So in my mind, I felt like I was doing what was in the best interest for this client, but it, some of it could have been more mental gymnastics because I didn't want to have a client with this much risk involved in my case, caseload in private practice. Like I didn't sign up for that. Like I'm good at it. I, I can keep people out of the hospital for years. I, I'm, I understand it's a skill that I have. I did not, especially at that time, I did not have the capacity for it. And the client was very upset. They even, even though it was only several weeks that we were in this process, you know, I think, I think in the second week I told them I was going to have to refer them out, but, but I just didn't, couldn't find the right person. I couldn't find a, a referral. And so they were very connected to me. They wanted to stay with me. They were upset. I got a call after they'd been hospitalized. Like, I want to come back. <laughs> like there was all of this that was basically like, you're doing the wrong thing, Katie, you're being selfish. And so for me, it was, it was a hard decision. And in those hard decisions is where we want to be able to go through these thought processes. And being able to do that helps us to be able to more clearly define for clients, this is for the benefit of your treatment. You know, if, if we're talking about this as a defensive practice, what takes it out of defensive practice is we're doing something for the, the better treatment for you as the client, as opposed to, I just don't want to be responsible if things go to crap. And yeah. It's just, it, it's, it's not cut and dry. And parts of this, and this is one of the takeaways that I was hoping to save more for the end of the episode, you know, wrap up podcast episodes with like good calls to action sorts of things. <laughs> so, you know, some of this is we, as a field, do have some pretty good prescriptive steps to take in some of these decisions. For example, Terrace off decisions. There are specific steps that are encoded into case law or statute in most jurisdictions. When a client makes a threat against a foreseeable, you know, target or targets, you do these steps and you are removed from liability. That is great. 
that is there there is no you know defensive practices that could be done better than that full stop yeah although i think some people use the, that those types of things to do assurance uh practices which we'll get into in a minute but like i, I agree i like having those prescriptive steps and I mean, do you feel like there are prescriptive steps besides, and we'll, we'll add the episode in the show notes on that has the, dis, the ethical decision-making 17 bazillion steps that, <laughs> that you can go through. It's, it's surrounding dual relationships, but I think it, it it's the process is useful in all areas, sure. but is there beyond that 17 step process? Is there something prescriptive for referring out, for example? Breaking in here real quick to tell you how much fun it is to put out longer form episodes and provide some CEs. I'm having fun. Are you, Katie? Mostly. <laughs> we've got some great stuff lined up for this year, and we've already got some amazing courses. Suicide, parental alienation, dual relationships, law and ethics. And some lighter stuff like walk and talk therapy, elite athletes, celebrities, executives, and goal setting. All you need to do is hop over to moderntherapistcommunity.com forward slash pod course, where once you listen to the episode, you just have to fill out a quiz and an evaluation to get credit. I'm going to bring another episode that we talked about, and this was actually a couple of episodes, but working around suicidality. Mm -hmm. You know, there's really concrete black and white spaces like client makes threat to go and kill somebody else. There is a very discreet amount of time that you have to be able to follow those kinds of things. There's very discreet time periods that you have to take actionable steps. Sure. Chronic suicidality versus acute suicidality is something where there's a little bit more flexibility. It's less defined sorts of things. And so we don't have tons of things within our field that have these very discrete moments sorts of things where you absolutely must do this at least here in california you know you have certain periods of time that you have to report child abuse or you have to report elder abuse that those things give you very prescriptive steps to remove your liability you know i see this and i hear stories i hear horror stories of therapists who have been working with clients for months or years even and the clients you know calls up and says hey i'm feeling suicidal i need another session this week or something bad has happened and i've heard therapists who are like i don't work with suicidal clients here's a referral end of end of relationship yeah no i i, I don't know that i've ever done that that's that feels really abandoning uh, it, but it, because it is <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's just, it's hard even from somebody that it's right at the beginning, you know, like, I, I feel like it's, it, I get that there are prescriptive steps, but sometimes it just feels like there well, are so many gray areas and wiggle rooms and all that stuff. Even reporting child abuse, I feel like people have a lot of gray areas. And hold, rooms hold, hold they. child abuse thing. Cause I want to finish up the suicide thing first. Okay. But sometimes what the prescriptive steps are is being a good therapist. It's you know, working with suicidality, it's ongoing assessments that unfortunately takes work therapists. Like you have to like keep coming back and being evaluative of where your clients are. It's not just like, oh, you've been given the suicide assessment. That means that you're good because you passed it. No, that's a snapshot in time. You have to continue doing the work. And so the, the, we want to have, you know, this really easy, all right, I did A, I did B, I did C. Here's the level where I absolutely need to hospitalize people. But when we do these assurance steps of hospitalizing people way too early, one of the things that we talked a lot about in that episode is this 2019 article from JAMA about here's all the after effects of what happens when you hospitalize people at way too high of a level, that they end up making more future suicide attempts. They end up having more accidents. And it's something that ends up being the absolute best example of 
here's a defensive practice that is worse for clients in a lot of situations, but it's done because it removes that liability from the therapist. At least if you're locked up somewhere for 72 hours, you you can't theoretically sue me for making things worse. But what I've found in working a lot more with suicidality, working a lot more as part of a, a treatment team here in my practice where we have people available for coaching calls. It might not be your individual therapist, but we've got people who can take those coaching calls in those moments and help work people through kind of a crisis moment. It ends up being something where we get people not going to the hospital and we get people dealing with things in their life and actually teaching skills and providing support at the level they need. My practice is set up a lot different than yours. Yeah. You've got and other people. <laughs> I've got other people and it's something that we like doing because it works. And we hear from clients that, oh, my previous therapist would just send me to, to the emergency room and I knew what to say when I got there to where they wouldn't admit me. Yeah. And I didn't need to go there. I needed somebody to do this instead. Sure. And I think the the thing that, that you're asking us all to do, and not you, but like what this, what we're saying here is that we have to sit in the gray a bit. Yes. Because there's, you talk about these prescriptive things and they sound good, but I feel like there's a lot of interpretation. I think there's a lot of knowledge that is required from therapists and uncertainty that we have to sit sit with as we're going through these processes, even if it's the the wonderful seventeen stage, you know, you know, ethical decision making process. I think that there's this element of this can be very hard. It can feel like I'm making a very subjective decision versus having a prescribed process that feels like I'm doing exactly the right thing. Because I, I think it doesn't always feel that way. Gas poorer. I must do things that are expected of a mental health professional rather than just following a manual that somebody else wrote for me to follow. And, and I get it. This is part of the developmental stages and the rigidity that we talked about in the develop but developmental stages episode. I think it's it's something where when we're dealing with risk, especially with clients ha that have very high levels of suicidality, homicidality, where there's a lot of stuff that feels really scary or, you know, eating disorders, substance abuse treatment, like people have these things that are like, oh my gosh, these things are so scary and they refuse or domestic violence or intimate partner violence. There are so many places where people get so afraid of these things that having some sense of security is, is more likely to have more folks actually being able to or wanting to engage with these types of clients because well, it is scary. It, and this is part of the change that I'm asking for here. It's changing the way that we approach things. Eating disorders are a great example of this, that it does require a very good education on how to work with eating disorders. Unfortunately, the way that a lot of eating disorders therapists talk about it is you are damaging any and all eating disorder clients if you engage with them because look at the death rates. You know, it's all yeah. of this anxiety sort of thing that pushes more of this avoid working with eating disorders to developing clinicians or people who just don't have the experience working with them. Rather than being, here's what good eating disorder treatment looks like. Here's the level of supports where you must insist on referring out. Yeah. And that's really more of the takeaway of this is we need to change the way that we talk about working with clients. It's providing supports at the levels that are needed rather than managing clients down into don't you say anything about this because otherwise I'm going to have to report you to some outside body, you know careful on how you talk about child abuse because you know if you tell me too much about this i'm gonna have to tell you know social services about mommy and daddy well i mean and we need to i guess talk about assurance practices uh de defensive therapy practices too but i think child abuse is definitely one where it feels prescriptive and people report too early 
I think they, there's certainly hospitalization, which we, we talked about, but even calling the cops or, or any of the things that therapists can do, which we know can be extremely harmful to clients and potentially involve them in systems that could hurt them in the long run, whether it's going to the hospital and, and increasing their likelihood of suicidality or calling the cops on someone that the cops don't necessarily understand and right. could use deadly force on. And so I think there's this element of how do we, how do we address the assurance practices? Because in some ways what you're talking about as prescriptive suggests taking action. And I can see people bringing that down to somebody said something about their parent saying mean things to them. And so I got to call CPS so they can assess it. And this again comes back to how we learn, how we're taught about things, how we teach and discuss things. It really opened me to looking at abuse reporting differently when it was described to me by a great mentor. Start with the question what's the injury? A parent yelling at a kid isn't necessarily injurious. Sure. If there's, you know, emotional responses to that that affect the child's behavior, blah, 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 it's repeated, it's, you know, and contains certain content. Okay, then we'd start building the idea of here's what emotional abuse is. Is it abuse in all situations to strike a child? I'm looking for any kind of an answer from you. <laughs> well, I think this is the hard one, right? Because I think like I had an agency that I worked at more than one agency that I worked at where it was anything other than an open hand on the bottom is considered abuse and must be reported. And when I look at what folks can do with an open hand versus, you know, somebody hitting somebody with a slipper, that's like basically a piece of fluff. Right. <laughs> you know, I think it, I like the the concept of where's the injury. I think it's something where, yeah, do, does is there any reason why you should hit a child? I don't know. I, I, I don't I think that, that it's such a complex thing. Like what it goes back to what is hitting a child? What is actually a, a, a hit versus something else? Well, and this is the part of really being able to define things. And sometimes it's worthwhile to get a little pedantic on this. What if you're, you know, teaching a child boxing and this is part of a sparring lesson? Yeah, I would sure. I would imagine that striking a child in those situations is okay. Sure. Uh, sure. Take that take that out of context, people. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll just make a little clip of Kurt saying hitting a child in that situation is okay. <laughs> But even in these prescriptive situations, there is a still an interpretation that needs to be done. Yeah. I, I think there's a little bit of common sense, huh? It does. And that's the part where making therapists anxious from the very beginning of their education ends up being, I need to avoid this anxiety. And it's what leads to more of the avoidant practices than the assurance ones. Here's another example. In EMDR, I hear a lot from clients that I've worked with. I hear it a lot from other you know, practitioners, even within the EMDR world. Don't do EMDR with pregnant people. And I, I look at this mostly from the idea that, okay, if the eye movement too hard, the, the fetus and the uterus are going to drop out. Like, is that... <laughs> But but it comes from this space that, well, we don't know what could happen, but there's no evidence that any bad has happened. You know, I went to a great training by uh, Dr. Mara Tesler Stein, who talked about, in case anybody hasn't noticed, giving birth is kind of a big shock to the body for for <laughs> both for both the baby <laughs> and the mom, like. Going through processing emotions during pregnancy ends up being something that, all right, if it sets the mom up for getting through stuff so that way they're less likely to have postpartum issues, they're more likely to create good, strong attachments with their baby after birth, 
maybe we should actually be doing EMDR with pregnant people who need EMDR. It yeah. takes some precautions with these things, but I've had clients in the midst of EMDR treatment that come to me and they're like, my OBGYN says I can't continue EMDR while I'm pregnant. Mm. And I'm like, okay, this seems to be one of those avoidant practices. Yeah. And I've been able to convince approximately 0% of my clients or their OBGYNs that this is actually something that can be modified in good ways for some clients, but this is just such a prevalent thing within medicine and, and therapy that it's just like, all right, somebody is pregnant, somebody is too old or too young for something, therefore it should not be done in any situation whatsoever, rather than going through a thoughtful process. Here's why this makes sense with this person. Here's my line of thinking with this. Here's the ethics that back up why I can do this with one client and not another. You're talking about things like your own capacity in being yeah. able to evaluate things. You know, it might be a, a super niche thing for yourself, but, you know, one of my, you know, toxic traits is trying to take on those clients that fit within my specialty, even when my caseload is too big. That yes. And we've talked about this, Kurt. You need to stop taking clients. <laughs> <laughs> but being able to take into some of the steps, you know, the the avoidant practices of like all dual relationships must be avoided whatsoever. I need to, you know, do my banking and my religious services seven towns over because a client might end up, you know, seeing me out in public. And if that happens, then I turn into a gremlin after midnight. The <laughs> versus, okay, here's how we hold healthy boundaries. Yeah. Here's how we can have those discussions. Here's the documentation, everybody's favorite part of this process. Here's the documentation that actually backs up that that discussion ended up happening. Yeah. So these are the kinds of things where it's changing the discussion to be more of, all right, in these ambiguous situations, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to question why is this rule here in the first place? And that rule may continue to benefit the particular situation you're in. But if the the answer to it is really just, I'm doing this because I don't want to be held liable, there's better treatment options for a client by, by doing this, write it down, document it. You're withholding beneficial things from a client to reduce your liability in these situations. You're doing bad therapy. Yes. Now, you may take a a swing and you might miss sometimes in doing something that could be thoughtfully beneficial to a client. It could be talking with a client about the level of supports they need so that way they don't have to go to the emergency room. And they might still make a a suicide attempt even with those supports in place. But if you document through, here's the thought process for why this decision was made in this moment, that's actually what limits your liability. It's not what the outcome of what the client did necessarily. It's more of what did you know? What was your thought process in doing it? And if that generally holds up to some good standards, then that's probably the most defensible thing that you can do. It's not not taking any action. It's what was your thought process in leading up to the action or inaction that you made? So trying to get practical with this, if we go back to the example of the client that I had who had hallucinations, was suicidal, and I felt was not, I did not have the capacity within my practice. And so the the documentation, if we're talking about that, one is my ethical decision making. Am I the right person? How the, is a client going to be harmed? Like I said, we'll, we'll link to the full decision making process at mtsgpodcast.com. But I think there's, there's looking at, okay, so ethically, legally, whatever the, 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 the way that I've looked at this, 
I am not the right therapist for this client. And so I'm going to refer this client to someone who is a better fit for this client's needs. So, so that part, right? So that's, that's one element. Mm -hmm. You're also talking about documenting in session, the conversations that, that I had with the client, right? Right. So I, yeah. I talk with him about this is my capacity. This is what it is. And in this particular situation, he kept coming back, but no, I want to stay with you. I promise I'll, I'll be okay. I won't need this many sessions for that long. I promise, please, please let me stay. And me understanding, no, this is not going <laughs> to go that way. Mm -hmm. This isn't how this works. I would be condoning this client not telling me everything just so they could stay in treatment with me, which is not great. Um, I continued forward with my process of referring this client out. I also... I also documented a consultation with the psychiatrist around treatment planning, continuity of care, that kind of stuff. And I, I think I did a warm handoff. This is so long ago. So theoretically, there's also a consultation note with the, the, the warm handoff to the new therapist. And so the fact that that, that client then failed out of treatment, <laughs> that isn't, I've covered my liability because I've done those things. Did I miss anything? So my decision-making process, which is in my own notes, not in the client's chart, right? Yes. And then there's the, the kind of the final decision and the conversations with the client, the consultations with the other professionals and kind of the referring the client out. Did I miss anything as far as what I document for this theoretically high risk client that I was not able to keep in my, in my, in my practice. The thing that I would encourage to add to that is here's how we evaluate this in an ongoing basis. Like okay. it, it, it's the way that you're describing it is if, if I'm presenting as the client here, I promise I don't need that much. Mm -hmm. I don't need that much assistance. And then they do. And this yeah. is kind of where some of that clinical experience and clinical gut knowledge that we talk about is like, I'm not so sure about this. So we're sitting yeah. in our own anxiety about this. Okay. We need to put in place that if we're going outside of what this treatment agreement is, we need to come back and reevaluate this. And that's the part of the discussion that I think would make what you're describing here really, really strong to say, this is the ongoing evaluation procedure that we're going to use. If it's a, each time of contact, we're going to discuss, Hey, remember that this was, this is going beyond what we had agreed that treatment was going to be. What other supports do we need at this time? And we need to kind of continuously evaluate is this the right fit for what you're presenting? Because I still don't have this capacity to extend to this high. The more frequent that you come back to that conversation when the treatment agreement is being changed, because the treatment agreement in this example is being changed. And, and to clarify what that means is I signed this client on for once a week therapy. Almost immediately that changed to twice a week therapy, which I informed my client at the time, I don't have the bandwidth to do twice a week therapy for any length of time. And mm -hmm. then when that was also, and then it changed again when there was additionally coaching calls that were required between those sessions. And then it was something where being able to, to document this is again, beyond my capacity right now. I don't have the space in my practice to do this. That's, I just document those each session, each yep. call, you know, as a reminder, I think the thing that that's hard here is what I'm really saying to the client in this situation is you're too much. And that makes, that hurts my heart. <laughs> and so there's also the piece of, of, I recognize that if I had the capacity, it would have been better for me to keep this client because they, they got the message that they were too much. The next person immediately hospital. I just like, it's, it's this thing of like, this is why it's hard because I could go the wrong way and not actually take care of this client either direction, right? Not be mm -hmm. defensive and, and, and protect my practice, but also not take care, good care of them. But I think there's this element of this decision is hard. Well, this decision is hard, but what's underneath that fear of 
telling the client that they're too much. Now, semantics here. I don't have the amount to support what you need right now. And that's nice, what I said. Yeah. That's what I said. But people, I, I, I have gotten clients before that, that, and I'm sure you have as well, that the therapists were like, you're too much for me. I can't handle your you. Right. And, and and I see people write that as clients on the internet all the time. My therapist. Yeah. Don't... yeah. And, and it's like, and I was trying to say, I don't have the space, the capacity in my practice at this point for what, what you're needing, the supports that you need. I, I think mm-hmm. I said it all the right ways, but it just, it hurts my heart. This is again, where I've had a number of things going on in my practice in my life right now that has really changed being able to talk in a very good way with clients. Here's the level of support that I think that you need. Here's the piece of this that I can fill in and making that more of a conversation from the beginning of treatment as opposed to being something that fits in someplace else uh, or ends up being several weeks or months down the line. And it minimizes the risk of that, and it makes it, again, come back to more of an informed decision. But unfortunately, what I think has happened is it's become so ingrained in therapist culture to just avoid this liability from the very beginning that it almost becomes a standard of care to not take on anything that anybody doesn't know the absolute most about. And that leads to kind of this therapists have to be experts about anything that they do in order to take that step. When really it's more, in general, we can at least be a piece of what the treatment is. And it's, again, I think a lot of the the reticence to doing this is we don't like doing the ongoing work when it could just be simplified within experience and things that we already know. It's ongoing work to continue to evaluate needs of a client. It's ongoing work to go through this decision-making process. It's ongoing work to document it. It's ongoing work to explain to clients this kind of support need. Sometimes we have the capacity for it. Sometimes we don't. It's not fixed as far as here's the amount of emotional energy that therapists have. But going through this process is what actually limits your liability. If you are reported to you know, the ethics committee that I sit on or to a licensing board and your documentation shows, here's the thought process, here's the communication, here's the communication the next session about this, here's the evaluative process that was then discussed and talked about with the client, we would look at that and be like, this therapist did everything correct. The client in this particular situation didn't like the results of this, but the therapist didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. That all makes sense. And I I like that thought process. And I think it's something where really looking at how do you document your decision making in these processes? Where do you put this documentation? How do you make sure that you're really going through these processes, I think is important. And I I don't know that that's an episode, maybe it's a, maybe it's a little handout that we create (laughs) that that really talks through like, when you're going when you're making these challenging decisions, this is how you cover your bases. This is how you do it. Because to me, with the the way that I was taught about things, yeah, it was document, just document, 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 but not where, not how. Right. It's just make sure you document it. And I think there's this other piece of, and be very scared and just try to stay away from all this liability as much as possible. And although it's uncomfortable, although it takes a lot more emotional regulation to do these things versus blanketly either push someone into something they don't need or refuse to provide something they do, I think there's that element of of a lack of certainty that I think make people really uncomfortable. And, and so I think we need to be able to, to do good therapy mm-hmm. and be smart about these things use common sense and you know i've mentioned it several times in the episode it's here's the stuff to do rather than the stuff not to do here it's the stuff it's the steps that you take it's the thought process that you put into it it's documenting that that yeah, it's really the process is... not the outcome exactly 
You can find our show notes over at mtsgpodcast.com. You can find the references for the basis of this episode there. Listen to the intro and outro for how you can get CE credits, if that's one of the ways that you want to support us. And if you want to support us in other ways, follow us on our social media. Join our Facebook group, The Modern Therapist Group. Become a patron. We have some background stuff that we do sometimes. And give it only to our Patreon members or support us on Buy Me a Coffee. And until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Renoy. Just a quick reminder, registration for the Trauma Therapist Network is only open now through June 30th. Go to bit.ly forward slash MTSG dash TTN, all caps, and use the code TTN save 20, all caps, to receive 20% off your first month. Don't forget, We've got some fun, interesting, and important CE pod courses over at moderntherapistcommunity.com forward slash pod course. Head on over and check them out. Just a quick reminder, if you'd like one unit of continuing education for listening to this episode, go to moderntherapistcommunity.com, purchase this course, and pass the post-test. A CE certificate will appear in your profile once you've successfully completed the steps. Once again, that's moderntherapistcommunity.com. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 